Hello, I think we're ready to get started. I want to welcome everyone today and thank you for joining our expert Q&A session covering network automation at Microsoft. Today we'll briefly share our team's approach to automating data collection at scale from network devices, but we intend to spend most of this session in Q&A, so we hope you came with your questions. So first, we'd like to um, have you meet the experts that you'll be interacting with today. Bart, could you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Dana. Hi, I'm Bart. Um, I'm one of the experts on the panel today. Um, I'm the software engineering manager that runs the team that delivers the automation. Next to introduce themselves is going to be Virginia. Thanks, Bart. Hi, I'm Virginia. I am a program manager on the team focusing on fact collection. And during the session, I'll be answering your questions in the Q&A and queuing them up for our speakers. Next up, I'll introduce Samuel Breck. Hey everyone, my name is Samuel. Um, I am currently a program manager on this team. I handle all things related to automation. Back to you, Dana. Hi, and I'm Dana Baxter. I'm a principal service engineer at Microsoft, um, but today I'll be moderating the session and I look forward to presenting your questions to the team. So thank you everyone for introducing yourselves and let's move on to what to expect today. So in this session, Bart is gonna kick us off with an overview of Microsoft's network automation journey. Um, we'll then use the remaining time for Q&A from the audience. Our intended audience is developers who are interested in automation of network uh, device data collection and configuration management. Uh, just a reminder, we will be ending this session on time at 5.45 Pacific time. So, um, what to expect in, uh, or I'm sorry, how to engage. So during this session, you'll post your questions in the chat box. You can post anonymously or you can use your name. Um, Virginia will be reviewing the uh, questions and publishing those to the chat window. So be sure to keep an eye on those and upvote your favorites. We're going to attempt to answer the most popular ones first. Uh, I know it'll probably get a little bit busy, but we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, and for etiquette, this information is just to make sure you're aware of the etiquette that's expected during this session. We may use this session for internal purposes um, and we ask that you do not record. The, the session will be recorded and the links will be shared out after the event has completed. Uh, please do not spam the chat box and of great importance, we ask that you please adhere to the code of conduct, which is next. I won't drain this slide, but please do not record, photograph, or film this session. And please help us to create a safe and welcoming environment. We won't tolerate any um, harassment, discrimination, disruptive, or disrespectful behavior. So the point really is just be respectful of us and others, and please don't record. So with that, let's get started. Bart, go ahead and kick us off. Thanks, Dana. So. Um, I'll go ahead and get us started uh, in this Q&A kind of to give you an idea of um, the types of questions that we'll answer and I'll give you a little bit of a um, overview of where we are today and kind of how we got to where we are. So back in um, 2017, we embarked on a journey in the network space to really start modernizing our approach towards network management. Um, a lot of the things that we did were uh, configuring devices by hand and rolling out services by hand. Um, so we started looking at how we can actually modernize our entire platform and look at different ways of uh, engaging the problem. So uh, one of the challenges that we faced was the, the by hand configuration. In 2017, we, uh, we went with um, Ansible automation to go ahead and solve some of those problems. As we started seeing the problem unfold, we did notice that there are other areas that we can tackle in order to provide a, a modern automation platform. And those areas are listed here. So one of the other things that we started looking at is events, um, and that was really the next step in our journey of how can we ingest events uh, from our network devices and you know listen to what's going on and start to manually process them. And in many cases, use the same automation that we created earlier to respond to those events. Uh, we're currently on the step of collecting facts from devices. A fact is just a piece of data from a device, whether it be configuration or state. I'm um, using that data to make decisions either now or in the future um, using things like machine learning and AI. 
And finally, our, our biggest goal with the, this whole platform is to go from being in, in a reactive state to a more proactive state and actually trying to um, predict what's going to happen on the network and look at um, both, you know, the alerts and the data that we're collecting and say, oh, you know, something's about to happen or something will happen in the near future. Let's address it before it becomes a problem. The capabilities that our, pro, that our platform provides are in those uh, four areas. So if you uh, look at the automation bucket, we use Ansible to automate. Um, that does run on top of Kubernetes. So if you have any questions there, uh, we'd be more than happy to answer them. We have event response, which captures events from the network um, and then attempts to push them back into the automation to do things like self remediation. Uh, one example of that is um, access points down. When an access point goes down across one of our many buildings worldwide, uh, we will actually trigger automation that will attempt to fix that. This has uh, led to our teams actually having a lot less tickets with access points going down because we don't have engineers going out and trying to fix those access points by hand. We just let the automation handle it. We're currently in the midst of our fact collection journey. Uh, we have a collector that goes out to collect data from our network, and we're using that to really funnel um, data driven decisions uh, within the network, which leads us to our final state, which is desired state. Um, in that state, we're looking to actually use the models uh, generated inside of fact collection for both state and configuration to then uh, push back into our automation platform and configure our network devices and drive towards um, being more proactive than reactive. Uh, so that's the general overview. Um, if you have any questions or uh, you know you see something that's of interest to you, feel free to ask it in the Q&A. Um, I'll go ahead and go back to Dana to see if there are any questions. And if there aren't, we do have a few pre canned questions that we're going to go ahead and ask. Thank you, Bart. We do have a question that has come in. <clears throat> so the first question is, what are Microsoft's plans on supporting Windows filtering platforms and interfacing to other frameworks such as Azure Edge, RTOS, .NET Core, et cetera? And are there any plans at Microsoft to support Layer 2 beyond Win32? That is a tough question. Um, I don't know that this um, that really is within our scope. Uh, the network that we're attempting to automate is physical network devices. So uh, layer two, layer three, switches, routers, firewalls, load balancers, uh, things like that. Um, that question is uh, out of the scope of this Q&A. Well, thanks. While we're waiting for more questions, Sam, I have a question for you. Um, what does automation at Microsoft look like? Thanks, Dana. Yeah, so to answer that question, um, kind of the way to view automation at Microsoft is kind of to view the journey that we've taken from kind of this cultural mindset shift from a network engineer to a network developer. Um, and kind of the things that we've set up to kind of enable that have surrounded um, building um, or helping the network engineers think of their job as if they were writing code. So right now, network engineers, they write playbooks that they published to GitHub repo that they peer review with their other teammates. And basically they take that playbook and they run it through our Ansible platform. What's helpful about the this setup we have is that once these network engineers are able to peer review each other's code, um, it kind of provides a central repository for them to not only set standards for different types of playbooks, but also help each other out. And we also have bi-weekly cute Q&A sessions, um, automation community meetups is what we call them, um, that we have in order for network engineers to bring common solutions to each other so they can kind of work out problems with each other. Thank you, Sam. Um, Bart, I have a question for you. So where would someone begin to create a model or framework to interact with all the different devices that you're managing? Yeah, so within our platform, what we're really looking at doing is um, really creating a platform. Um, in the in the past, uh, the approach that we've taken was to go out and go get the data. But as we start looking at scaling out and uh, like Sam mentioned, really doing a transformation of um, the, the skills that our network engineers have towards the network development role, uh, we look to create a platform where engineers could actually define those models themselves and tell us what data they want to collect, um, making it more self-serve 
So at least within our platform, uh, we do have a repository where engineers go in, they would define what data they want and how to collect it, which in turn would then funnel into um, the fact collection system and would show up at the other end in our data store. Thanks, Bart. Um, we had another question come in. Uh, Virginia um, did uh, answer some of it, but I think it might be worth expanding on. Um, so Bart, what are these devices that you're managing? Vendor hardware, generic servers, what roles do they play? Um, she mentioned that we're managing about 17,000 different devices, but maybe you could just expand more on the complexities of collecting data from so many different types of equipment. Yeah, definitely. So. Within our network, uh, we do manage the entire Microsoft corporate network. Um, so like Virginia said, we're close to 17, 18,000 devices. Um, that includes routers, switches, firewalls, load balancers, uh, the wireless that we have in all of our buildings worldwide. Um, the, the complexities there that we really do find is because of the vast majority of these devices, um, having a user at the other end and users using them in different ways, collecting the data from them and the ways that they're configured uh, tend to be different from place to place. Um, so, and, you know, it's, sometimes a device is running di a different software version or sometimes that device is, you know, a completely different model in order to solve some sort of problem or uh, provide some sort of solution that's more custom to that site. So as we collect data from these devices, really standardizing that model. I think one of our biggest uh, issues that we run into today is when we go ahead and when we work with all of these network devices, they all still work in a very kind of old and monolithic way. So our fact collection today is us taking and running a bunch of CLI commands getting raw text back from the device and then parsing that text into a JSON model that we can actually interpret. Now with network devices, you know, one vendor may have certain features that another vendor may not have. So there are definitely some complexities there where, um, you know, making sure that the features that we're defining within these models are either vendor agnostic or doing a sort of translation where we can actually say that you know these two features you know one vendor may call it one thing another vendor may call it another but there needs to be a way for us to in this model call those things the same thing and at the end of the day if that um, feature is configured differently that's really where our automation platform comes in uh, when it receives the model and how it interprets that configuration. But at the end of the day, we still want to be able to create the, the intended configuration um, in a vendor agnostic way within our platform. Oh, Dana, you're on mute. Sorry about that. You know, I was just trying to be conscientious of the <laughs> streaming. Um, Sam, I have a question for you. The Ansible platform is Red Hat. Does this require purchasing an Ansible license from them? Hi. Yeah, so if you want the enterprise version, it does. Um, regardless, you need to buy the license to run um, these instances on Linux servers, but they actually have an open source version called AWX. Um, which essentially is the same thing. It's just kind of their um, dog food version of the platform. And it is actually a platform that we are planning on switching over to. So right now we do run the enterprise version, but we plan on switching over to the open source um, free to use version called AWX. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Bart, I have a question for you. I think you're going to like this one because they said the word Terraform. So will the network automation native to Microsoft um, become in line with other uh, infrastructures, code tools like Terraform? Yeah, thanks, Dana. I'm actually looking through the Q&A right now, and I also saw Terraform. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of Terraform. I love Terraform. Um, I would say that the platform that we're building and the tools that we have, they, they do work hand in hand. Um, a lot of, we share a lot of common um, traits between the platforms, such as, you know, having a single source of truth, using a, um, Git as the single source of truth and having a version control system to control the different configurations. And we also do a lot of um, infrastructure as code, you know, things. Um, our, you know, the platform that we enable, we call it network as code uh, internally. So 
uh, while they won't interface with Terraform directly, um, since we do work with a lot of physical network devices, that was uh, one of the other questions that I saw. Um, it is physical network devices. So if there comes a day where we can um, programmatically create a physical device, I think, yes, uh, we'll definitely integrate with those tools. Um, but we are trying to create uh, a platform uh, internally, at least to run all of those physical devices in our corporate network. Okay, we have a really good question uh, for you, Bart. For things like load balancers and firewalls, do other engineers at Microsoft need access to request changes? And what is that process like? That is a great question. So um, yes, with, with the automation, when an engineer goes out to write a piece of automation, um, or at least let's take automation completely out of the picture. If I as an engineer want to go change uh, either a configuration on a load balancer or a firewall, we do have a process in, in place called least privilege access. So every engineer does not have access to every single device. It is only certain sets of engineers that have access to those devices. With that in mind though, uh, when we have platforms that do changes such as our automation platform, the automation platform itself does have full access to all of the devices. So when engineers do write these automations, I as an engineer don't necessarily need firewall access to go make changes on that firewall. Um, however, I do need to go ahead and go through a peer review uh, process of my code with the firewall team before it actually goes into production and that automation runs. Um, and then if I want to go and trigger that automation manually, I would actually have to have access to those devices before I can run a piece of code against them um, that would make any sort of configuration changes. Thanks, uh, Sam. Can you tell us? Um, can you share some details about the data that's collected? Is it config data only, or performance operational data as well? Yeah. So right now it is only config data. So whatever config state is on the device, we are currently collecting um, questions or metrics about performance and stuff. We are currently integrating into our system, um, but we are currently not co collecting at the moment. And Sam, could you speak some more to um, what network are we automating? Is it Azure networking only? Hi. Oh. Sorry, that was for Sam? That was for Sam. Hello. Hi. So we are currently automating the corporate network. Um, we do have several rings of um, se segregated networks that we do work with. So we have some lab networks, but it's mainly just the Microsoft corporate network. Azure networking is its whole separate thing. Bart, how are you integrating data from devices that you are streaming from versus collecting via CLI? Thanks, Dana. Yeah, so um, one of the, our big changes that we're actually going forward for right now, um, and I mentioned it earlier, how we collect data from network devices today via CLI. So um, if, if you think about it, you send a command to a device, it spits out a bunch of text, and then we have to do regex parsing on that to pull data out of this into something that's usable. Network devices are starting to support um, this concept of streaming telemetry. So the devices themselves would just uh, send telemetry out in already a pre-formatted way. Um, and it, it's both a lot less impact for the network device because it's beaconing out the telemetry to us um, and also a lot less um, resource usage on our side because we don't have to establish a connection with the device, log in and, and perform all of these things to just set up the connection before we can get the data. Also on top of that, we're getting the data that we're really looking for. So instead of us getting this you know, big raw blob of text, it's already um, coming to us in a structured format. That is really the next generation that we're looking towards for getting this data. Um, I also mentioned earlier how we're modeling this data. It's actually really important to us that the data comes in and that our platforms, um, you know, the fact collection platform does receive the data, but it's also important for that automation platform um, and that desired state platform to understand the format of the data. So as the data comes in, we do data transforms to make sure that the format of the data and the model of the data is the same in all of the different platforms. 
So just a quick follow up question to that. Um, since you're talking about the benefits of streaming telemetry, is the collection, the automation that you're doing and the usage of the data, is that influencing how the organization looks at purchasing equipment? Yes, definitely. Uh, when we talk about um, the the types of devices that are automatable there we internally track devices that uh, do support these next generation models um, we also look at current devices on the network that could potentially stream data to us uh, by doing things like a software upgrade on the device um, i do also see there's a question in um, about the parsers and the data models that we have. And I think this is actually a great time to answer it. So the data that we get from these devices, um, earlier when we talked about, you know, let's say for example, um, we have a uh, device from vendor A and a device from vendor B, and both of them do support streaming telemetry. Uh, what we have noticed is while a lot of vendors are going towards uh, this um, open source model called open config, um, there isn't a lot of, uh, I mean, all of the stuff in that open config model is generic across those vendors, but there often are cases where there's specific uh, features where you would buy, you know, one, one device from one vendor over the other. Um, and that's really those features, um, you know, at the end of the day, when we purchase network devices, uh, we also look at those features. Um, and, and when we say, okay, we're going to buy this from vendor A instead of the device from vendor B, we most likely have bought it because vendor A may have a specific feature. Um, so making sure that we can do that transformation. Yes, a lot of the models uh, that we have are from scratch. They do reference vendor models and we look at how open config um, has created their models um, as like a best practice when we build ours, um, but we do define our own data model within the platform. Thank you. Uh, Sam, uh, you say your network engineers are writing Ansible playbooks, which is awesome. Can you give examples of what are the things they are changing, automating day to day, and how are the playbooks organized and managed? Yeah, sure. Um, so probably the most basic day-to-day -day operation um, is deployment of network devices. So a lot of our engineers are actually using playbooks um, because they're templatized to go ahead and deploy um, network devices that fit under that template. Um, some other use cases are SNMP password changes. So we roll our password every X number of days, and that is a big operation that is spread across 17,000 different network devices. And our system is able to process that in one batch, um, in one job. Um, and kind of the way that they're organized, as I said earlier, they're all put into one big um, GitHub repo and each team owns a different section of um, the network. Um, so for instance, um, core routing or um, deployment are owned by separate teams. So they are able to interact with each other's playbooks um, on that GitHub repo. And in addition to that, um, we also have that session we have bi-weekly. Um, but in terms of how they're actually managed, we all store them in a GitHub repo. Uh, and another question for you, Sam. Are there any automation tools that can switch easily to resources from Azure back to on-site server resources running the same service? Sorry, you cut out in the last part of that. What was the last part of that question? Uh, the, are there any automation tools that can switch easily to resources from Azure back to on-site server resources running the same services? That might be a better question for Bart. Sorry, Dana, would you mind asking it one more time? <laughs> Whoever wrote this, you should give yourself little pats on the back right now. It came in as anonymous, so I don't know. Um, are there any automation tools that can switch easily to resources from Azure back to on-site server resources running the same services? Ooh, this is a good one. Um, I don't know that there are any right now. Um, and that's actually why we're doing what we're doing with network automation. Um, in our organization, there is this big move towards, you know, move everything to the cloud, right? And I'm sure many organizations, you, you're getting the same pressure from 
uh, your management from your peers, you know, moving to the cloud. It's the cool thing that, that everyone's doing today. Um, you know, the one thing that we can't move to the cloud is that physical connection of the user actually getting to the cloud. Um, and, and actually, as we saw a big move at Microsoft internally to move all of our apps um, into the cloud, what we started seeing was a lot more users had a higher reliance on that physical corporate network. Um, so originally, if you think back, um, you know, you may have an app that's running um, in a uh, company owned data center and now it moves to the cloud. OK, well, now that user that was sitting and interacting with that app at their computer on a day to day basis uh, performing their job, they now need to have a stable Internet connection in order to get to that cloud. Oh, and you know, now they're expecting that application also works the same way it worked in a data center. So where you may have had a physical dedicated connection into your data center and you were able to provide it for all, I, I don't know, 10,000 of your employees, you know, now you have to go via the Internet. And yes, you can use technologies like uh, Azure Express Route um, and get private peering into Azure in order to enable those types of scenarios. The physical network itself still will remain, right? Um, now, on top of that, there's also a greater um, security problem with that physical network. As hackers are getting um, more and more uh, complex with the ways that they exploit, they are starting to use the network as a means of hacking um, and actually causing disruptions. So it has also become way more complex, the configurations that you have to put on that physical network in order to be able to secure your enterprise and get your users there. So the natural evolution for us is to create this automation platform in order to really give engineers the tools to grow um, and support more network devices. Because what we are seeing is uh, more network devices are coming up. The configurations that we have are getting more and more complex and there's more of them, um, but the number of network engineers is not changing. So in order to really enable um, the network of the future, you know, the, the tools that we build are, are our solution. Good question, Anonymous. <laughs> Thanks, Bart. I just want to mention that we have three minutes left um, of the presentation, so I'll ask you another question, but we're going to be wrapping up pretty soon. Um, between ARM template and Azure CLI or other alternative, what's advised ADO CICD implementation, Bart? Yeah, this is a, uh, this is a tough one. Would you mind reading the question one more time, Dana? Sure. Between ARM template and Azure CLI or other alternative, what's advised ADO CI CD implementation? Yeah, that, that's a tough one. It might be out of the scope of, of this talk uh, around network automation, um, but uh, I'll share at least for our space in ADO when we build servers, uh, we use a combination of uh, those ARM templates to build out the environment, make changes using um, the Azure CLI tool. Um, and we also have uh, had a little bit of experience in the past with Terraform uh, to deploy um, different uh, resources for our automation platform. Can you, Bart, talk a little bit about how you're using um, Kubernetes to scale the platform? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so uh, we are using Kubernetes in our environment. Um, if you haven't heard of Kubernetes, Kubernetes is the next cool thing. So if you're already in the cloud, you should go try Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a uh, distributed, um, it, it's a platform that allows you to run your containers on. So we're leveraging Kubernetes to really create a scale within our platform and respond to changes. Uh, so uh, it's very easy for us to just add more capacity in terms of servers within Azure into Kubernetes, uh, which in turn allows us to run more containers and run the workloads. Uh, so when we talk about things like automation and fact collection, those are all uh, containerized pieces of code. Uh, they do get built in ADO via the CI uh, CD process. When an image gets built inside of ADO, it gets pushed up to Azure Container Repository. Um, so if you haven't checked that out, Azure Container Repository is actually really cool. It allows you also to replicate your images globally. Uh, so one of the things that we have is we do have a global Kubernetes stamp. Uh, so when we write automation, we, we interact with network devices. Our network devices are global. Having the platform closer to the device 
gives both our automation platform and our users a way better experience uh, interacting with that device and running automation. Uh, so by pushing those images into Azure Container Repository and then running them on top of our Kubernetes clusters, which sit regionally, uh, we're able to uh, run all of our uh, platform components uh, with scale. So if at any point in time we do see an increase in, say, the amount of automation jobs running, uh, we could just scale the component that runs our automation jobs, which is um, Ansible in our case, uh, to go ahead and just have more capacity for running those jobs. Similarly with fact collection, there are times where uh, we will collect more facts than others um, on a scheduled basis. And during that time, we just essentially add capacity into our cluster, scale that workload out, and when it's complete, we scale it back down in order to be cost effective. Thank you, Bart, and thank you everyone for joining us here today. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, don't forget to fill out the survey and Virginia is going to post some links to our blog uh, in the chat window. Also, you can find us on LinkedIn if you'd like to talk with us some more about automating a network effect collection. Thanks very much.